As you just heard, I wrote a book a few years ago, which was organized around central questions that people have about the Holocaust. And there were eight chapters in the book, each had one of these questions. They weren't original with me. I had learned over the years from teaching my students what kinds of uh, puzzles people approached the class with, what they wanted to have explained. And tonight I'm gonna try to uh, condense those questions into two which you just heard. One is, why were Jews attacked and killed? Which is a question not only about the motives of the people who did it, but also a question about how a society could become collectively ready to do such things. And then the other question is, why didn't anybody uh, put a stop to it or prevent it from happening? And here too, it's a question not only about attitudes, but also about the conditions that prevailed at the time. So I want to, but let me start with some numbers, because I think the first thing to realize about the question, why were Jews killed, is that the Nazis were almost uniquely obsessed with Jews. Jews occupied an entirely different status in the eyes of Nazi true believers than any other of the so-called other victims groups that we think about. The Nazis literally were convinced in a kind of magical thinking that the beginning to the solution of all problems, not only Germans' power political, Germany's power political problems, but also all social problems at home, the absolutely indispensable thing that had to happen in order to solve all those problems was the removal of the Jews from the German sphere, wherever that would happen to be. And we will We'll show how important that term is in a minute. So this was the absolute sine qua non of everything they hoped to achieve. The Jews had to be removed, and they were remarkably thorough about it. This chart shows you of the various groups that the Nazis attacked, what percentage of them were in fact killed. 67% of the Jews of Europe, roughly 6 million out of 9 million, but in fact, the Nazis killed 75 to 80 percent of the Jews that ever came within their reach. This indicates a remarkable degree of concentration on eliminating that group. No other group that was attacked by the Nazis, and they had plenty of enemies and plenty of categories that they wished to kill, no other group experienced that kind of slaughter. Soviet prisoners of, of war, who the Nazis systematically starved to death, under three-fifths died. The inhabitants of German insane asylums and sanatoria and so forth, perhaps 30% of them were killed. These are people whom the Nazis regarded as useless eaters, people who detracted from the war effort. But they weren't mortal enemies. They weren't to be systematically rooted out. They were just to be culled, as it were. The gypsies, the Sinti and Roma people, the Nazis attacked them inconsistently. Sometimes they would move into an area and wipe them all out. Sometimes they would leave them all alone. And this had very little rhyme or reason to it. Sometimes Christian gypsies were treated badly, but Muslim gypsies were treated better, and so on and so forth. In the end, about a quarter of those who lived in Europe under the Nazi regime were killed. Gay men, the, Germ the Nazi regime did not believed that all gay men had to be removed. It believed that German gay men, or men who were having sex with Germans, were undermining the fighting spirit, and were, and in the case of German gay men, were failing to do their national duty by procreating. Those people were to be removed. But if you were gay in Warsaw or Prague or Paris, the Nazis couldn't care less. With regard to the, what happened in Poland, you can see the difference most strikingly. 90% of the Jews of Poland were killed, 7% of the non-Jews of Poland were killed. Even though the Nazis hated many categories of Slavs, even though they intended to colonize Poland and gradually reduce its native population, they did not try to wipe it out with the same fury that they applied to the so-called Jewish question. So the question is, why this obsession? Why this, and why was it possible to act out this obsession? 
And I think the answer depend can the answers can be broken down into two categories. The first have to has to do with the kind of hatred that Jews have experienced in Western societies to varying degrees over a very long period of time. We tend to refer to that hatred nowadays with the word anti-Semitism, but the word is only 150 years old. Whereas the long tradition of isolating and punishing Jews is a great deal longer than that. It, in fact, goes back to the beginnings of Christianity, which is the shaping force of Western civilization and was for hundreds of years the determining factor in what held Western civilization together. Now, as far back as the onset of Christianity, an animosity developed between Christians and Jews, and a tradition in the Christian community of regarding Jews as dangerous and contaminating developed. Why contaminating? Because Christianity began as an offshoot of Judaism. It took over the main teachings of Judaism, monotheism, scripture, and covenant. That is, there's one God, God's instructions are recorded in a set of books in which he reveals himself to the faithful. And covenant, if you accept what is in these books, then you have a special relationship with the Lord, which in the case of the Jews was a, a covenant that was made by Abraham and Moses between the people of Israel and the Lord. If we keep your commandments, we will be a light unto the nations and an example to the world. And Christianity took all these things <clears throat> and changed them. Monotheism became the Trinity. One God, but three forms. Scripture was not just the Holy Bible, the, the Hebrew Bible. It was also the Gospels and the Epistles, the so-called good news that Christianity brought into the world. And covenant was not the deal that Moses and Abraham made with the Lord. Covenant was something that you entered into the moment you accepted the good news, the teaching of Christ's revelation and, and, the, and the writings of his followers. Now, when Jews were presented with this new form of their old religion, um, they said no. They said no, thank you. We already have our form of these things, and we wish to continue. Once Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire in the fourth century of the Common Era, that no became an irritating um, issue to the powers that be. Because if, if people could say no to the new teaching that was the official religion of the empire, and they could prosper and do well, then what would stop other people from saying no? Wouldn't this become a danger to the faith? Wouldn't this become a, a, a license for nonconformity? And the Bishop of Hippo in North Africa, who, who is now known as St. Augustine, developed teachings to deal with this matter. He said, on the one hand, the Jews were once the chosen people of God. We cannot kill them. They must survive. They, they will not be eliminated like every other her heretical group that arises within Christianity. On the other hand, they must suffer because they have rejected the teachings of the Messiah. They have rejected the organizing faith of our world. And so they must be contained. They must live only in certain areas. They must do only certain professions. And this is the origin of all of the systems of separation that developed between Christians and Jews over a period of roughly um, 1400 years from the time Augustine wrote uh, these teachings. Those, and, and so Christianity, Western civilization developed with a tradition of hostility toward Jews and mistrust and fear that they were contaminating to faith. Now, by the late 18th, uh, 18th century, the late 1700s, this sort of domination of Christian ideals and theocratic principles was breaking down in Western civilization. We all know about the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal. Some people know about the Declaration of the Rights of Man, which was issued during the French Revolution, that said that all people are equal in the sight of the law. In fact, there were even autocrats, people who were opposed to popular sovereignty, 
who believed that Jews had to be released from all these restrictions in the 18th century, because then they could participate fully in society, be more productive, and if they're more productive, the monarch can tax them more. And this is the so source of a doc document called the Edict of Toleration that the Austrian Emperor Joseph II issued in 1780. So by the end of the 18th century, 1776, 1780, 1789, there is a lot of pressure for the emancipation of the Jews, just as ordinary people are now to have rights and privileges and voting capacities, then, all, then Jews are to be able to enter into all walks of life just like everyone else. The armies of the French Revolution spread this doctrine throughout Europe. And when Napoleon fell, the people who wanted to reverse the achievements of the French Revolution, the monarchs who had been historically in power, rolled back many of the decrees that had freed Jews from having to live only in certain places or practice only certain occupations and so on. The 19th century in European history is the history of the rollback of the rollback. The ideas of the French Revolution gradually triumph in many ways, not only with regard to the emancipation of the Jews, but also with regard to having free elections and parliaments that have more power than monarchs and so on and so forth. The story of the 19th century is the spread of liberal ideas and free principles from the West to the East. And part of that spread, not only of democracy and judicial rights and civil rights and all of that, is the emancipation of the Jews. The last country in Europe to emancipate the Jews and make them equal with everyone else was Romania in 1919 as a condition for it being part of the League of Nations and acquiring new territory from the defeat of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Now, during that century, as Jewish, as Jewish people became gradually regarded in most European countries as citizens, as equal with everyone else and capable of doing the things everyone else did. This was not the only thing going on. The 19th century is the century of the Industrial Revolution as well in Europe. And what happened in the course of the Industrial Revolution is on the one hand, spreading prosperity, rising opportunities and standards of living for many people. But on the other hand, there were people whose situations declined. Clergymen generally enjoyed less prestige than they had under the preceding era. Aristocrats saw some of their fortunes declining because often their fortunes were invested in agriculture, and agriculture is the problem child of the 19th century across the Western world. Uh, transportation increases, prices fall. As a result, farmers are exposed to much more competition in the course of the century, and as a result, and they are often, therefore, um, driven off the land. At the same time, there are whole walks of life that are eliminated by the rise of factories. Most shoes in Europe were handmade in 1800. By 1900, they were machine made. And the number of people who were involved in doing that was much smaller at the end than it was at the beginning. There were many walks of life that we refer to as artisanal, making things by hand that are replaced by mean machine production in the course of the 19th century. Now I'm referring to this because what the nature of hostility to Jews changes in 19th century Europe. It is much less, particularly in Western and Central Europe, much less based on religious differences and, and, and rivalries, and much more based on a sense that while the Jews are as a whole doing better, some of us are as a whole doing worse. And there must be some connection between those two facts. So this is the origin of a, not only the word anti-Semitism, which is invented to describe a new kind of hostility to Jews, not a hostility based in their religious attitudes and ideas, but one based in the sense that they are fundamentally alien. They're different from us. And the word was coined to say, and the ism at the end is designed to give it a kind of scientific gloss. And the word was coined to say they're collectively different because what are they? They're all Semites. What are Semites? Semites are actually people who speak Semitic languages, Hebrew, Arabic, 
Aramaic, the language that Jesus spoke. And what the these new haters said is they're all held together by a mentality that is created both by the area in which they still lived, arid, desert, not very fertile, and by the language that they speak, which is unlike all European languages, which are uh, rooted in, um, they're, they're called Indo, almost all European languages, they're called Indo-European languages, and they arose out of Sanskrit, which is an ancient Indian tongue. The migration of people who spoke, uh, who spoke Sanskrit brought those languages into Europe centuries and centuries before the common era. But Semitic languages were different, and these new haters focused on first the belief that these people are collectively different because their mentality is shaped by their language and their place of origin, and they are economically threatening. They are the people who are doing well while you are doing badly. And the audience for this sort of, um, this sort of uh, doctrine is, of course, the people who are doing badly. And in the 19th century, anti-Semitism is, in a sense, kind of um, universally present. There are people writing books criticizing the Jews from the 1850s on in virtually every country of Europe. They, they concentrate on economic rivalry and the sense of you are suffering, it must be caused by those who are rising. These books sell. Um, there is a good deal of attention to them. There are political parties that arise and make as their central doctrine, the Jews are our misfortune. The Jews are the center of all our problems. But the remarkable thing about the 19th century is the persistence of this ideology, the fact that its audience is also continuous and out there, but it never wins power. It is an idea, the only example of an anti-Semitic political figure getting elected in 19th century Europe is a man named Karl Lueger, who gets chosen to be Lord Mayor of Vienna. It happens, in, in fact, just about the same time as a Jew is elected Lord Mayor of Budapest. So uh, anti-Semitism is not universally on the rise. In fact, in most places, it doesn't do very well. And in Germany, which is kind of the hotbed of a lot of these publications and political movements and even professors who uh, lecture uh, and, and uh, at the University of Berlin and lecture and proclaim that the Jews are the center of Germany's problems, these people never win a majority. The anti-Semitic political parties in Germany never get more than 5% of the vote in a parliamentary election between 1871, when the German Empire was formed, and 1912, the last election before World War I and the overthrow of the German Empire. Now, this is the background. Anti-Semitism has religious roots in Western culture. It has a persistence that arises and is reinforced in the 19th century by economic and racial animosities, but it is largely contained. And the story changes remarkably in 1918. It changes as a result of two things. Uh, Germany's defeat in the First World War makes Germany a particularly sensitive place to charges that somebody is behind your misery, and I know who it is. And at the same, and then a year before, the Bolsheviks have won in Russia and become the rulers of what becomes the Soviet Union. And the fear of communism in Western Europe grows and grows. And on this, and this provides a new breeding ground for people to say, see. They're behind that too. They are, many Jews are leftists, and that was true in, in many cases because leftists offered, op, offered opportunity. They offered social equality. They offered a chance for societies to be more egalitarian. And that appealed to many people who had suffered discrimination. So there, the 1920s become a kind of hotbed of <clears throat> ideologies. And in Germany, the sense of victimization is so strong that people feel that they were they were unjustly treated at the end of the war with the, uh, the loss of territory that was incurred with the war guilt clause in the Treaty of Versailles, who said the Germans had caused the war and they must pay for it. And then with the reparations bill that was imposed upon Germany a few years after 1918, in which they were supposed to pay for all of the war damage that had been caused in Belgium and France and so forth. And with this sense of victimization, Adolf Hitler had a good run. 
because he what he basically said to Germans is, this is not your fault. All of the misery you are experiencing, not only politically from the defeat, not only the humiliation of that, but also from the enormous inflation of the German currency, which occurred in the early 1920s, and then from the depression, which hit Germany harder than any other country in the world, Hitler could look out at the Germans and say constantly, this is not your fault. This was done to you. And the people who did it were the allies with their unjust peace, the Marxists who overthrew, uh, overthrew the German emperor, and the Jews who are always conspiring against us and who are the wire pullers behind these other things. The problem, <clears throat> and Hitler, therefore, um, in 1928, he got 2.8% of the vote in a national election. But then in 1930, as the depression gripped, he got 18%. In 1932, there were two elections. The depression had gotten worse. First, he got 37%, then he got 33%. So we, we go from a situation in which Hitler is not a force politically in a very short time to a force where he, he is the the part he and his party are getting more votes than anyone else. And this, um, it's not that Germans all were anti-Semites or even a majority of them were. They don't all flock to Hitler for this reason. They, um, the, the problem, they, they flock to Hitler because he, in, he manages to convince people that his party knows better than any other party how to solve the nation's problems. And though he thinks part of that solution is we're going to eliminate, we're going to get the Jews out of our, our country, he also talks about other things. He also offers an economic program that will revive the, the economy. He also promises to make Germany great again on the international stage and uh, reverse the terms of the Treaty of Versailles that have been a problem. And the, and the, the problem in Germany in 1932 is the weakness of anti-anti-Semitism. Many people who don't have any particular hatred toward Jews still have a kind of suspicion that has been created by all of these publications and agitation and so forth. And this is what brings the Nazis into power because the opponents of the Nazis were deeply divided. Hitler got more votes than anyone else. And the president of the Republic had the right to pick the person who would be prime minister. He picked Hitler. He did so on the assumption that the that he and the other people around him in the German upper classes would be able to control Hitler. And this was an example of famous last words. Within six months, Hitler had turned the country into a dictatorship, largely out of intimidation uh, by, by, uh, by beating up and scaring his opponents, uh, but partly by co-opting them. And by June of 1933, he was the undisputed master of Germany. And then he was in a position to control the not just the attitudes of the people who had voted for him, that third of the electorate. He was in, in, in a position to increasingly impart his ideology to the others because the regime had a total control over the media. It had total control over education. It picked off and eliminated all the oppo opposing political parties and sent their leaders to concentration camps. And the ideology he taught these people was very simple the law of the jungle. All existence is us versus them. We all struggle for what he called our daily bread. Life is constant and perpetual struggle. There are no rules in this. The Sermon on the Mount is will make you weak in this process. Uh, the Marquis of Queensbury, I doubt he'd ever even heard of. And so what he, no holes are barred. All life is, the, is, is winning or losing. And in this struggle, it's us versus them. It's us, the Germans, the folk, as he called it, the people, against all of the other forces arrayed against them. Not, not just other countries, but people within Germany who believed in international brotherhood or the harmony of man or any of these, what he would have called weak and milquetoast doctrines. Those people weaken the state. They disarm us. And therefore, we must purify our society make it as militant as possible, and eliminate all the corrosive forces within. Well, of course, chief among those, he had long said, was the Jews. And in this struggle, only we matter. There are no external moral principles. What matters is what's good for our victory. What's, what's evil is what is bad for our victory. Now, this ideology is repeatedly 
foisted upon what, the non-Nazi parts of the German population. And it, is, and it spreads because of a combination of intimidation, indoctrination, and intoxication. The intimidation is clear. If you don't endorse this ideology, if you don't go along, you can be arrested. People were beaten up on the streets routinely in 1933 because they didn't raise their hands in salute as a Nazi flag went by. And the police did not intervene. No one protected the victims of that violence. Indoctrination was relentless. In schools, there, there were no foreign media allowed in the country. This is before foreign radio broadcasts could get very far into Germany. So the, the constant repetition in the absence of counter voices, and particularly the churches were increasingly cowed by Nazi, the threat of, of violence. And then the third thing that really made it made this ideology so widespread was not so much the, the fear and the repetition, it was the intoxication of Hitler's successes. He pulled the nation out of the depression faster than any other nation recovered. The way he did it was unsustainable. It was massive spending on armaments and on industries that would substitute for exports, uh, for imports, that is, would make Germany free of interference from outside if it came to a new war. And he devoted billions and billions of marks to the construction of these factories. Um, good example of what they did is they, they made gasoline out of coal. Germany had no uh, native gas, very little gasoline they could pump out of the ground, uh, oil that they could pump out of the ground, but they had ample supplies of coal. So they turned this process into the making of fuel from that coal. It was vastly expensive. It was much more expensive than it would have cost to buy fuel that was imported and refined in Germany, but it was free of the danger of blockade. And this, so this combination made the regime extremely popular in the 1930s. And it was capped by the success of marching into Austria and taking over Austria, marching into the Sudetenland, the per perimeter of Czechoslovakia, and taking that over after the Munich conference. And then in March of 1939, marching in and occupying the rest of what is today's Czech Republic. In all of these cases, no German uh, died of, uh, of hostilities. These were bloodless conquests. And Germans said to themselves, wir sind wieder wer, we're somebody again. And the Führer has made this possible. Now, what happened in the course of this is that Germany was transformed into a potentially murderous society because so many people who had not voted for Hitler, who had not been part of that one third in 1932, were, were part of the four fifths by 1938. And that meant that they were prepared to do the things that this ideology taught. Why among those things was murder? Because you can remove people in lots of ways. The Nazi regime spent five years trying to drive Jews out of Germany, try to make their lives so miserable, make their economic prospects so poor that they will leave. The problem was that, of course, there were limits of the willingness of other countries to accept Jews because the depression was, was going on. But also many Jews did not want to leave because they were too old to contemplate a future uh, outside of the country. Or maybe they had um, parents or disabled children or that they felt they needed to stay and take care of. And by 1938, Hitler had managed to remove uh, about, uh, by the end of 1937, he'd managed to get about 40% of the German Jews to leave. But there were still 60% of them there. And the problem with that for the Nazis was that there was a fundamental contradiction in the two things they centrally thought to achieve. The one was removing the Jews from the German sphere, and the other was living space, acquiring new territories so that Germany would have greater resources to support itself. Now, as the country expanded, it wanted to expand to the east, to Poland, Czechoslovakia, out to the Ukraine. These happened to be the areas in the world that were most thickly settled by Jews. So there was a fundamental contradiction between the goal of removal and the goal of expansion. And in 1938, late in 1938, many of the Nazi leaders begin to realize this and their vocabulary changes. They no longer talk about removal. They begin to talk about annihilation, vernichtung. And you can see this in various documents in November, 1938, and in a speech that Hitler made to the parliament. 
And so the story of 1938 to 1941, when the mass killings begin, is the story of realizing that they are capable of annihilation. And in a sense, they might as well do it. They find that they have gone from the motive, we have to defend ourselves against the Jews, to the opportunity, war provides a cover for all kinds of atrocities, and means they know they have the ability to remove large numbers of people at relatively little expense um, by, by the use of gas. And they have discovered that in the course of culling the uh, people out of the German mental institutions and the sanatoria. So in 1941, in the aftermath of the invasion of the Soviet Union, the Germans, it's basically September and October of 1941, the Germans think, why wait? We, have, we want to expand. We are acquiring ever more Jews as our armies move to further and further east. We already are at war with the whole world, with the single exception of the United States. And by the fall of 1941, Hitler thought that's coming. The Atlantic Charter had just been signed between Churchill and Roosevelt. From, Hit, from Hitler's point of view, the United States might as well be in the war already. So there was no reason to stop. Now, having said all of that, that's the sort of background to why were Jews killed, because the Nazis had this fixation, because they were able to persuade a whole society to act on that fixation, and because they thought the time had come, they, that the numbers had forced them to making a decision. So now the question becomes, how did the rest of the world allow this all to develop? I want to start with these third parties here, rather than the top line there, because I want to suggest that they, the third parties always, always had something in common. What they had in common was they had something more important to do than to help. It doesn't remember whether we're, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about letting large numbers of Jewish refugees into the United States in 1934, or whether we're talking about bombing Auschwitz in 1944, or whether we're talking about the American government or the International Red Cross, or the Roman Catholic Church, the common denominator of all of this, or even of forces within Germany itself, the common denominator of all of this is all of the people or institutions that or entities that could have interfered with this process almost always pulled back, and they pulled back because they had something more important to do. Now, what was that? For instance, there were lots of potential opponents in Germany in 1933 who thought that Hitler's coming to power and Hitler's belief in this ideology would be disastrous for their country. Uh, the example I always point out is there were four German ambassadors in the spring of 1933. They were in uh, London, Paris, the United States, and Oslo. And they communicated about whether they should resign. And at the end, only one of them did. The uh, ambassador in the United States, a man named von Prittwitz und Gaffron, he quit and he stayed in America. Um, the others decided, no, you have to continue to serve your country. One of them said, you do not leave your nation in the lurch because it has a bad government. And they thus begin to, they stay and they lend their talents to the regime. Why do they do that? Because the diplomats, like the generals within Germany, or the business leaders in Germany, many of whom in 1933 thought Hitler was not going to be good for the German economy, those people all had some partial identity of interests with the Nazis. The generals wanted rearmament. The businessmen hoped for economic recovery, and they knew that the regime would suppress the trade unions. So that was enough to make them co cooperate in the early stages. The diplomats wanted to reverse the Treaty of Versailles and restore Germany to equality with other powers. So this was enough to make all these people pull their punches. And within three or four years, they are all totally neutralized or working in service to the Nazi regime. Outside of Germany, the countries that might have stood up to Hitler, <laughs> all felt constraints. In the, in the first place, uh, it was a practice of international law in the 1930s, um, and right up until uh, after World War II, that governments refrained from interfering in the domestic uh, uh, operations of other governments. So condemning what the Nazis were doing was regarded among in diplomatic circles and government circles as a violation of that principle. We shouldn't do it. Uh, 
And with regard to immigration, all of these other countries thought, well, we have our own things to be concerned about. If we let in German Jewish refugees, they might compete with people that we have here at home at a time when unemployment is still high. It did not fall in the United States. And when it fell gradually in, into 36, then in 37, there was a recession. It went back up and began to go down in, in late 38. But there were plenty of people in the United States who said, our own citizens come first. And this was duplicated more or less in every other country. The, uh, so the nations surrounding Germany initially allowed refugees to come in, but became more and more restrictive. And when you get to after the war began, the issue of interdicting the places, the deportation trains and so forth, generally it was regarded as not a top priority. Uh, one way of thinking about this is with, with regard to the bombing of Auschwitz, we, we became capable of hitting Auschwitz only in the spring of 1944, when we had advanced far enough up the Italian boot that you could send a plane from there to Auschwitz. You never could get a plane uh, during the Second World War from Great Britain to Auschwitz and back on a single tank of gas. And, and at the point that we became capable was also the point we were, when we were preparing the landings in Normandy, when we were trying to eliminate the V1 and the V2 rocket bases along the coasts of Belgium and Holland. And so military leaders always said there's something more important to do. I can tell this story with regard to the Catholic Church, if you want, where the, the dispensing of the sacraments was more important than the saving of Jewish lives. And with regard to the International Red Cross, which knew about the murders as uh, almost as they started in the gas chambers, but decided that its most important mission was to provide care packages to prisoners of war in all the armies behind all the lines. And if they criticized the Nazis on this, it might impede that mission. So they remain silent. Now, with regard to um, the Jews themselves, their ability <clears throat> to restrict what was happening to them was always limited by the fact that they were too few, they were too divided, and they were too alone. In the United States, Jews made up 4% of the population. In most of Europe, they made up much less than that. In Poland, they made up 10%, and in the Soviet Union, about 7.5%. Um, they were internally, but the, even these figures, they were internally divided. They were divided between people who were traditionalist in religious observation or people who were very secular. And there were people who were Zionists and people who weren't. There were people who were leftists and people who were very conservative. All of these different strains within Jewish communities had their own institutions. And when the Nazis began to descend upon them, even, even this is true in the 1930s in the American community observing what was happening in Germany. They had a hard time agreeing on the answer to two questions. What are the Nazis going to do with us? And what's the most effective response? And their social and institutional divisions made it harder to cross, to talk across these lines and then to get agreement across these lines. And finally, they were too alone because uh, Jews in America made up only 4% of the population. Their political influence was very limited. Um, they, <clears throat> and in Eastern Europe, they were uh, generally regarded in, in hostile terms by the surrounding populations. And so they got very little hope, very little help. Uh, they were, in fact, if, it, if I'll flash forward to this, in Eastern Europe, they were caught in a crossfire between nationalists who hoped to preserve their independence and leftists. The Soviet Union had occupied much of Eastern Europe in 1940, before the Germans descend upon them. They took Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Eastern Poland, um, Bessarabia from Romania. In all of these areas, people who wanted to be independent reacted vehemently against the Soviet occupation. And <clears throat> they hoped that if the, when the German invasion comes, we will get our autonomy back. So for these populations, the Germans are the lesser of two evils in Eastern Europe, but for the Jews, the Soviets are definitely the lesser of two evils because they're not, they don't plan to kill you. And so this is the kind of crossfire that they're caught in. And then finally, this is what I, I wanna show you a few pictures to give you a sense of this. And, and this is the conditions that separate from the attitudes that made stopping this process very hard. The first is that the Nazis developed a very fast and cheap killing process. 
it was out of the Allies' reach, and they did mo and they did most of the killing while Germany was winning the war. This this will give you an idea how fast and cheap this was. This is the site of Shamno. Somewhere between 150,000 and 225,000 Jews were killed here. <clears throat> it was an old building. It had been a manor house, and then it was an apartment building. The Germans took it over. All they had to do was build a wooden fence on this side and a gate, a wire fence on this side because there's a river, a couple of wooden fences around the other side. They trucked people in on this driveway. They made them go down this stairway that I'm showing you. They passed through this uh, passageway as they did. All their last possessions were taken from them. They were made to march up a stairway here, and there was a ramp, more or less where these cobblestones are, backed up to the ramp were, were moving vans into which the exhaust pipes were connected. People were pushed into the vans, the doors were locked, the engines ran until the people died, and then they were carted off. Notice how cheap this was. The building was already there. The trucks are, are army trucks. Gasoline is not very expensive. There's very little input. This is Belchech. 600,000 people were killed here. This is a the outline today of the memorial, but if it is in the same dimensions as the camp. It's about 300 yards this way and about 200 yards that way. They built a series of ramshackle buildings along here out of wood. It's the kind of stuff you could get at Home Depot. They brought people in here on a railroad line. They unloaded them right there. The first gas chambers were right here. There was no pretense of secrecy. They beat people right into them. They gassed them. They then used these black spots that you see here. These were old uh, ditches that had been dug as anti-tank ditches because this was along the former border between Germany and Poland. They dumped the bodies in there. When the graves overflowed, they took them out and they burned them in these sites and the ashes were scattered there. It's very low tech, very low infrastructure. The camps were located here. This is Shelmno, Treblinka, Sobibor, Belchech, Auschwitz. They are all right around here in the general government. They were out of reach of American bombers until they get here when you can go up this way. By that time, Auschwitz is the only one still operating. Now, that's a very important fact that people often forget. Not only did this occur in a very small area that was far away, it, it occurred very fast. Um, of the 6 million dead, 77% perished while Nazi Germany was winning the war, up until the time that the Germans surrendered at Stalingrad. 75% of the victims came from only three countries, Poland, Lithuania, and the occupied Soviet Union. About 600,000 of those people uh, were dead by the time Germany invaded Russia, and 4 million of them died in the next 18 months. In fact, 3 million were killed in one feverish period of three months. And so this is all occurring very fast. It's occurring with remarkable concentration by place, Eastern Europe. There, that's where most of the victims came from. And it is and by, concentration by both place and time. And so what you have is a process that by the time the Allies became really capable of um, intervening, it was so late in the process that relatively few people could be saved. All right, I've talked a long time and I've talked fast and I'm sorry that I, uh, for that, but I hope I've given you an overview and I hope I've given you reason to ask some questions, which I would be glad to try to answer in the time we have remaining. 